Johan, thank you very much for joining us My today. Pleasure. Um, I wanted to start with the first time I heard about your work was when you made the, published a paper saying that you could use social media in order to make predictions about the stock market. So tell us a little about that. Yeah, that was um, a result of a year-long effort to, to look at how the mood state of the public could be gauged from social media data. You know, there's, there's hundreds of millions of people on Twitter. They're telling us about their lives, their, their life's experiences. They're telling us how they feel as well. And so we're aggregating that data uh, to uh, derive some kind of barometer for public sentiment and public mood states as it changes over time. And, uh, and, and since then, we've been looking at correlations between not just public mood states, but also investor mood states and the mood states of, of particular in, uh, communities and how they correlate to a variety of socioeconomic phenomena. And so does this information actually make you, uh, allow you to make predictions about, in the case of the market, what the market's going to do? Yeah, yeah, it does. The, well, I mean, it's it difficult to say, you know, when are you actually predicting, right? Because people are going to say, well, you're right yesterday, will you be correct tomorrow? For example, if, if you're thirsty, there's a high likelihood of you drinking. Right? And so if we could measure whether you're thirsty, we could predict that you might be more prone to drink something in the near future. So what are the types of things you're predicting now then? We've done the stock market, let's put aside my being thirsty. What, what else are you predicting? Yeah, well you perform this kind of psychological analysis of how people feel. You can lo look at a variety of different dimensions of, of, of their psychological state. You could look at, for example, unrest. You could look at anger and hostility. We're measuring that as well. So you could look at regions of the world where social um, anger and hostility and confusion are very high. You, you might be able to predict uh, social unrest. I mean, if I mean, if we're all uh, uh, strongly stressed, anger when our, our social ties are becoming stressed, that definitely has implications for public health as well. So it's not just market predictions; it's just about anything that is socially determined and that manifests itself in some way or form uh, in social media. You can pick our algorithms can pick up on, analyze over time, and then derive useful predictions from. And so tell me a little bit about the data itself. Do you, I, I guess you need a lot of data to do this? There is a qualitative, qualitatively different aspect of this kind of analysis in the sense that we've got one-seventh of the world's population on Facebook right now. So you've got the coverage of the world's population, and the, in, not just in terms of the number of individuals involved, but also uh, the detail to which they divulge the, the, most per, the most personal details of their lives in public right, have, has, has fundamentally changed. So we're literally talking about data sets that, that are on, on the order of magnitude of you know, 500 million tweets per day, uh, a billion people on Facebook. It's, it's, we're talking about large swaths of the world's population engaging with these, these social media environments on, on, on a daily basis and sometimes many, many uh, different times in, on, on the same day. And uh, how do you get the data, or in what form do you get the data? Yeah, that's, so, so th that depends, but you know, these, these, these social media corporations, if you can call it, if you look at Twitter or mm -hmm. Facebook, of course they realize the value of this data, so they sell it. And uh, you know, the, 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 the product is not Facebook, the product is you. You know, let's make that joke. A lot of people don't realize that t television is not in the business of broadcasting shows. It's in the business of selling your eyeballs to advertisers. And social media is no different. So they do collect the data. So these are essentially computer files. And they make those available to people willing to pay the price. And so give this in a really practical sense. Now, what, what do you think you can predict? I mean, for example, what are we predicting here? Yeah, on this graph, what we're showing is that we're looking at a community of investors. So these are people that have given us indication that they're interested in investing. So we limit it to that group. And of course, that, that, that little bit of the secret sauce of the, the startup and the technology mm. you know, is, is encapsulated in that, in that statement. So we're looking at people who have given us the computer some indication they're interested in investing. We start to track them longitudinally. So we're looking at whether they're, they're becoming more uh, clear-headed. In this case, this is a measure of confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, they say that the market's driven by fear and greed. Right? So we're measuring fear as well. We're certainly measuring uh, greed as well, but also clear-headedness and confusion. Because when investors get confused, it, uh, it causes volatility. And, and so what you see in this graph is essentially that we're measuring the, the fluctuations of investors' uh, confusion over time. This is for uh, uh, nearly half a year. And you've got a trend analysis of that, of that data signal. And the trend analysis is essentially telling you when the uh, confusion in the investing community reaches particular uh, values that, would, that, that could inform uh, a smart investor that is subscribed to our feed, at least, of, of when to buy and when to sell. So th this is more than just theory. I mean, you've gotten a patent on this, right? You've got that's a right. company that's doing this. 
Um, can you just tell us a little more about the practical applications of it? Yeah, the practical, in this case, <coughs> we, uh, the, the startup um, has uh, licensed the technology from Indiana University mm -hmm. because they, they own the IP. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a nice license. I mean, IU has been very kind. They, they're also, uh, they, they hold stock in the company uh, as a result of that arrangement. And what the startup does is essentially that it pays Knip or Twitter, in this case, for their, their feeds. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're absorbed by our computers. It's all cloud-based. They, they parse out all of these tweets, perform this kind of analysis, and then we make the analysis available through uh, a number of uh, uh, platforms. One of them is, for example, a dashboard like this, where investors have something similar to a Bloomberg terminal. And in right. this case, it's focused on these kind of predictive indicators that are generated by our computers. Uh, but there's also an API where, for example, hedge funds involved in algorithmic trading it can, can hook up their computers to ours, and then the computers do all the work. They talk to our computers, they get the data back, and they automatically trade accordingly. And then once you find patterns, whether it's at the individual level or, or, or at a more macro level, is the thought that you'll be able to go look for those patterns so that even if people aren't providing all of the other information, you can recognize that pattern? From exactly, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds really Orwellian, uh, but that's not the intention here because this is public data. These, you know, these are people that voluntarily wrote these tweets. Of course, the fact that we can find the hidden signals in those tweets is really interesting. Right? I mean, the wording that we choose on a given day to describe how we are, right? I got up this morning, this is going to be a fantastic day. Th th that doesn't necessarily mean it, you feel great. That right. could actually be, indicate that you're trying to perk yourself up a little bit because you're not looking forward to that day. So the computers can learn to, to for, especially when there's enough data, they, they can learn to, to detect these kind of hidden signals that are even hidden to the individual themselves. And if we could leverage that to make advances in, in, in public health, for example, in actual interventions, that would be very worthwhile because the data the data's out there. And these are people that, like little human sensors, right, are reporting about what's happening in their lives and the lives of others. And if we can use that for, for social good, for example, if you could send a, uh, a tweet to an individual like that and tell them, hey, you know, things might be pretty dark right now, but here's a few things that you right. can do, you right. know, that, that could be tremendously useful. Right. So, where's your research going next? What are you What are you looking at next? And well, you know, honestly, I've, I've recently I've been been thinking about sort of this whole interplay between the you know so everybody's talking about networks, right? That's right. A, that's a really hot topic here at IU. The, the, you know, we founded a network institute mm -hmm. that has sort of world class researchers working. Um, uh, uh, working on the topic of network analysis and what it can do for society and what it can do for science. But I've, I've become really fascinated by this interplay between the, the topological structure of the network, so what the, what the network looks like, and what the nodes of the network look like. So I'm on social media, for example, right? right? And so you, you, can, you can tell who my friends are and what my social environment looks like. But the biggest mass of data that is out there is really pertains to me as an individual. So this is the notion of the quantified self. So what I'm really interested in is, it, it, I think the, the, the preponderance of data right now is not for, uh, us knowing that we're connected on, on social media, that's a, that's a social connection, right. but knowing things about myself as an individual, uh, you know, what I've been eating, how much sleep I've been getting, how I feel on a particular day, whether I'm planned to travel, uh, you know, how much money I'm spending, what am I spending it on. All of that information pertains to the individual. So I think that what I'm really interested in is using this kind of, using network science to learn more about the individual and helping individuals learn more about themselves. Right, so where if you had to think about <coughs> data sources for the future, I mean, who would have predicted Twitter, Twitter you know, 15 years ago, or mm -hmm. Facebook for, for that right. matter, but do you envision entirely new sources of data? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm actually a big proponent of, well, one's called the proponent, but of the notion that wearable computing is going to be big. Right. So this whole notion of the Internet of Things. And th that automatically means that there's going to be more of an egocentric aspect to the data. You know, if you look at the iWatch, apparently, you know, it was going to be instrumented to measure your, your, your pulse and your potentially your blood, blood pressure. I, I know that the oxygenation of your blood can right. be measured. Uh, like that as well. So we're going to have a whole bunch of sort of physical, emotional, and psychological measurements occur in the next five or six years that are essentially generated by the computers that we wear on us, that we interact with in, in, in sort of our physical reality. So it won't be something that I'm going to go to the Twitter website and I'm going to interact with Twitter. This is where I'm going to be interacting with the network continuously. That will be an essential component of who I am and what I want to be. And I think that that's where most of the data in the future is going to come from. There won't be these, these sort of carved out social media environments that we actually have to go to 
and that would have to be lured into. This will be data generated by, by our environment, by the, by the chair I'm sitting in, the watch I'm wearing, the glasses you're wearing, not just the cell phone, just about anything that we wear in our bodies that will help us to live. Well, I hope you succeed. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure.